Okay, everyone, let's get started. Um, so today we are going to be talking about some very recent methods for improving um, language models further. And uh, the goal here is to align language models with human preferences. So like what ideally humans would want to see as responses to certain prompts or instructions that we feed in as a prefix to the model. So actually, before we start, uh, I wanted to show an example of what we are talking about here. So this um, prompt here, what is the purpose of the list C in the code below? And you have this snippet of code here, um, if you can see this. And so last time we talked about these huge scale language models and how they're so capable of doing things. But this is a completion of this prefix from GPT-3. Um, as you can see, it uh, decides to generate multiple choices uh, and basically trying to convert this, this prefix into uh, some kind of exam question, right? This is not the intended behavior. The person inputting this prefix into the model wanted an actual answer, not multiple choices for someone else to answer, right? And so uh, you see this much more broadly with many different types of prompts. So for example, you might want your model to you know, not output harmful text in response to a particular prompt, or not output misleading um, text, or non-factual text, or many different kinds of undesirable properties. But as we know, these models are trained on to predict the next word on the internet, and there's many undesirable things in there. Uh, and also the model learns weird things like this where it thinks that a likely continuation to this prefix is just to make a multiple choice question, which is clearly not what we want. So um, the uh, purpose of this is just to demonstrate that next word prediction on a large data set can only get you so far um, because you're learning like what is most likely based on what I've seen in my data but maybe we want to change the behavior of the language model based on you know, what humans actually find useful. So after applying some of the techniques that we'll talk about in this class, we see that um, the generated uh, sample from this model is much better. Right? It's actually explaining what this list C is doing instead of something completely useless like this. So um, this is kind of the high level motivation here. Um, let me switch back. I'll switch between this paper. So, so uh, that uh, example is from the uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback paper. This is like a 60, 70 page paper by OpenAI who uh, have kind of pioneered this particular way of modifying language models. Okay, but we'll talk about two topics today. Um, the first is instruction tuning, which is a, a simpler way to kind of get these language models to follow commands and do uh, solve certain tasks. And the next thing we'll talk about is reinforcement learning from human feedback. So the goal in both of these techniques is to align large language models with human preferences. So some examples are, um, you know, make their outputs uh, less harmful or toxic, um, increase relevance uh, of the outputs or other properties that that we care about that we as humans when we're using these models to solve certain tasks actually care about okay so uh in this class we'll touch on two main methods for doing this and the first one we've already seen many times before um so two main methods the first is just supervised fine-tuning. 
So we're going to find examples of the desired behavior that we want the language model to exhibit and then just fine tune the model to increase the probability of those completions. Um, we've seen this over and over again with the pre-train and fine tune um, paradigm, right? So in all cases here, we're starting with a base language model, say GPT-3, the 175 billion parameter model, and we are fine tuning it or otherwise modifying its parameters using some signal from humans. Um, the other technique is reinforcement learning. Um, and so in this case, we, instead of just doing normal supervised fine tuning on, uh, you know, like high quality outputs, we will instead receive a reward for many different samples from the language model. So we talked about um, what a sample means in the previous class, right? When we're talking about decoding algorithms, we apply algorithms like nucleus sampling or top K sampling or whatever to get a long continuation, like a multi-word continuation, right? And at each token of that sequence, we are sampling a word, right? So after we go through this process and maybe we sample a couple paragraphs, now we might get a reward from either a human or some external model that tells us how good is this generated sample. Um, and maybe you can say, have a bunch of these samples and have the, uh, a reward for each one so you know that this sample is better than this other sample. So if you just have this kind of information, you can actually adjust your model parameters through reinforcement learning to prefer higher reward sequences over lower reward sequences, where prefer generally means you increase the probability of high probability, sorry, high reward sequences and decrease the probability of low reward sequences. So uh, as you'll see, like both of these methods are accomplishing a very similar goal. And um, they differ in some key ways uh, that uh, make the optimization process a little better. Uh, I will also say that the, the method reinforcement learning from human feedback was really introduced by OpenAI over the past couple years and just showed its like uh, true potential in chat GPT. So the paper if you look at the readings for today, it came out like very late last year. Um, and basically, the uh, advantage of this paper is they got a lot more human judgments in order to fine tune their model. So um, it's still very unclear if reinforcement learning is actually critical to making these things work, or if it's just cleverly using the human feedback to uh, improve the models. All right, but the first thing we'll talk about is instruction tuning. Um, this is a very simple uh, method to understand, but it's also um, quite effective. So in instruction tuning, our goal is to kind of help the model better follow instructions that are given to it in the prefix. So for example, if I want to say, translate the sentence from English to French, colon, and the sentence, right? Maybe our pre-training data doesn't contain that many examples of this kind of format, right? Where there's an instruction, an example, and then the model is supposed to solve whatever the next uh, input is. So in instruction tuning, um, we are just going to fine tune our pre-trained language model on data that looks like instruction, example, output. So the only fine tuning it's receiving is of the form of these um, examples that are augmented with instructions. And the idea is that if you want the model to be able to follow human instructions, you should just directly teach it to follow those instructions. Um, okay, so let's uh, take a look in a little more detail. So step one, we will collect a data set of instructions on what task to solve and outputs of that task for one or more 
examples. <laughs> so let's take a look at um, how this might work. Uh, let's say as an instruction, uh, I have a question, sorry, I have an instruction like, please answer the following question and provide a detailed justification. So this is the instruction, right? I'm not just asking for an answer to the question. I'm asking for a detailed justification or the steps of reasoning that was used to get to this uh, particular answer. Um, so as our question, let's say, what was the average of the CS685 spring 2023 midterm? So let's say that this is my question, right? And if I gave this to GPT-3 without this kind of tuning, maybe it wouldn't be able to actually understand what these instructions meant or how to generate an answer to this. So I could also give it the correct output, maybe something like, I can't answer that question because the midterm occurs on April 12th. So that's legit also, you should study for that. And it is March 27th. So here you have uh, actually a very good example of how you want these models to behave. This question has a false premise. So if a normal language model just spit out an answer, like 87, right, that would be completely misleading. Um, so it actually shows the, uh, the justification for this answer as well. So the method is actually extremely straightforward. I will just uh, take the instruction. Um, oh, sorry, I should write it down here and feed it into a um, large language model. And the model is going to produce the output and we will supervise this process. So we'll fine tune the entire language model. Fine tune the LM to produce desired output given instruction. And of course, this is a very expensive process, right? We're fine tuning a very large language model on this kind of data. The, the critical thing here is the data. You need to have instructions and outputs. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, so even like an encoder decoder model can use this technique, right? You can put the instruction into the encoder and have the decoder generate the um, output. Yes, so BERT would not be able to take advantage of this. Uh, in general, the output here is a long sequence, right? In this case, it's a full sentence, right? It's not a classification type of thing. Yeah. So I'm assuming that like the data sets that they use to do are way smaller than what they're preparing the data set. Yes. Is there like a fear that if you optimize it too much on this data set, it'll like lose like a lot of the knowledge it learned from the pre training? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, the uh, premise is correct. The data sets used to fine tune a model on these instructions is much, much smaller than the pre training data set. And if you keep fine tuning the model until it reaches some very, very low loss for, for a lot of iterations, you might overfit the small um, instruction tuning data set and forget some of the knowledge of the pre-trained model. We will see this again in, when we talk about RLHF. Uh, this is very important. They actually put specific penalties into the model to prevent it from deviating too much from the pre-trained model. Um, in this case, it's probably sufficient to just fine tune for one epoch with a low learning rate to avoid making too drastic updates. But 
um, yeah, that's something that in the hyperparameters to your optimization, you're going to try and minimize like how many, um, like moving too far away from the, the base model. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's a good question. So in this particular example, uh, the language model is asked to produce today's date, but obviously a language model is trained once and has no access to this kind of real-time information. So maybe this is a bad example. I just used it because to inform you all that the midterm is on April 12th. Um, but that said, uh, newer um, adaptations to models like ChatGPT uh, essentially use external services to retrieve real-time information and put it into the uh, prompt. So, uh, for example, like when ChatGPT was released, people were trying to figure out what the actual prompt is underlying everything on the interface. And a lot of the time you would see things like, oh, today is March 27th, the 2.30 p.m. There's some external service that is creating a prompt that is uh, used for all of the um, uh, inputs that the users send. So, um, yeah, we'll talk more about this later on in the semester. There's new things like um, plugins of these language models to external services that can control them, even though they're not part of the, the training data. Um, yeah. So, there are cases that the output has the same meaning as the expected output, but like, you know, different. Orders or like yeah. different sure. How do you handle those cases? Uh, that's a good question. So in this kind of setup where you have a small fine-tuning data set, there might be many acceptable outputs. Like even in this case, right? Uh, we have, I can't answer that question because a midterm occurs on April 12th. I could just reorder the information, right? I could say today is March 27th, the midterm is on April 12th, therefore the question is unanswerable. And I'm not uh, you know, directly optimizing the probability of that sequence. Uh, in general, like this is something that also the RLHF method has a better handle of. Uh, in this case, you are increasing the probability of one specific output where there might be multiple acceptable ones. But you would hope that in this process, you increase the probability of um, the paraphrases of this continuation as well. You don't know for a fact that that's happening, but the results uh, of this method show that it does indeed generalize not just to the tasks that you give it instructions to, but to new tasks whose instructions you never saw before at training time. So kind of an empirical uh, justification. Okay, let me just um, give a little more detail of this paper. Um, so they, uh, another difference from the normal pre-trained fine-tuned paradigm here is that, uh, let me just write it, unlike what we've seen with pre-train and then fine-tune, instruction tuning, which is what this method is called, um, fine tunes on many different tasks at once. So uh, in this paper, um, which is called FLAN, it's also one of the readings, they created a data set of, I think, hundreds or thousands of different tasks paired with example input and outputs for that task. So this is a simple QA style task, I might also say translate this uh, paragraph from English to Bulgarian or something, or solve this math problem and give me all the steps. So, so many, many different tasks in this format. So the format here is actually more important than the task itself. The goal is for the model to be able to uh, better understand, understand instructions of what you want it to actually produce. And um, as you can see in the paper, um, instruction tuning improves performance, so generalization, on uh, tasks that are not seen 
steering, fine tuning. So this is like the, the best result of this paper is that if you can collect examples of say a thousand different tasks paired with instructions, you fine tune your model on this data, it turns out that the model gets better at following instructions in general, not just on those tasks. And so um, as you can see, when people want to use language models, they want to use instructions. They want to give it specific instructions of what to do. So this kind of instruction tuning better aligns the language models with what the users of the model actually want. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, there probably is. The original Flan paper did it on like a 130 billion parameter model, which is a Google's Lambda model. Uh, but since then, that team has been um, using the same method on smaller and smaller uh, models. So they released Flan T5, which is a much smaller, uh, we, I mean, we talked about the T5 model. It's 11 billion or even 3 billion parameters. There's a smaller version which follows instructions. I mean, it's not as good as a bigger uh, language model, but this method still improves its performance on these kinds of instruction-based tasks, uh, even with smaller models. That said, you do observe, like, as you get bigger and bigger language models, the absolute performance goes up, uh, which it shows you the power of scale. OK, so let's uh, talk about some limitations of this approach. It's clearly quite promising, and also it's nice that it's extremely simple, right? We just have to collect some data and fine-tune our model, and it's better at instructions. However, getting data is expensive. Especially for very complex tasks. So in the original paper, they collect generally very simple instructions, like the instructions could be a phrase or a sentence, and the tasks are straightforward. But you know, people want to use these kinds of models for much um, higher degree of complexity tasks, and it's hard to get uh, instructions and outputs. It takes a lot of effort for humans to give demonstrations of this. Um, some tasks don't have just a single output. One single acceptable output. So this goes back to your question. Um, like I would say the question up here is uh, it, it still has one answer, right? The question can't be answered, and this is why. There's one reason why. Um, but, you know, if I ask you, write a story about a unicorn that uh, goes to space or something, right? Um, that's an instruction, but the output, there's many, many possible outputs, right? So if we just optimize our model to, you know, prefer generating a single story in response to this, we might be missing out on many other um, potentially acceptable generations. Um, and finally, this method does not directly involve human preferences. So if the model generates five different stories about unicorns going to space, and I have a human read each one of these and rank them or give them each a score, I have no way still of encoding those human preferences into my model, like updating my model to respect those preferences with this uh, technique here. So um, this kind of motivates the other technique that we'll be talking about today, which is um, Reinforcement learning from human feedback. And this directly addresses some of the issues that we've um, talked about with instruction tuning and fine tuning in general, specifically the latter point. So here we assume that you have access to human preference data. Um, for example, in ChatGPT, right, if you uh, 
say if you type in something and it generates an output, you have a thumbs up or thumbs down um, option, right? You can say if you like it or not. Um, you can also delete an output and regenerate it, right? You can generate it many, many times and then pick a sample that you like best. Maybe you thumbs up one of them. This gives uh, OpenAI or whoever the uh, service provider is a lot of information on you know, what output do humans most prefer. So naturally they would like ways to um, you know, optimize their models to produce outputs that are more likely to be thumbs up, right? So how do we do that? Let's just write out um, some of the inputs and outputs uh, to this overall um, process. So in all of these cases, you assume that you first pre-trained a large language model on next word prediction, just like we've talked about uh, throughout this class, right? This is a decoder-only language model for you know, all of the cases for which this method has been applied, GPT-3, GPT-4, chat GPT, Anthropic has their own um, models that are tuned via this method. All of them are decoder-only models. Um, that doesn't mean you can't apply it to encoder-decoder models, just no one has uh, at scale, at least. So let's say we have a prefix x. Um, so this could be, you know, write a story about unicorns uh, in space. So we pass it to a language model. Uh, and we have it, say, generate um, three samples. So each of these samples can be like a story in response to this prefix, right? And so how do we get these samples? Uh, we can use any decoding method that we want other than uh, deterministic ones like uh, greedy decoding, right? So we need three different samples from the language model. In practice, it's very common to use nucleus sampling, which we talked about last week. So in nucleus sampling, of course, you at every time step um, sample a high probability token from the distribution, but not necessarily the highest probability. Um, so if I use nucleus sampling, I will get three very different stories about unicorns in space. And now, let's also say that I had humans come in and um, give me scores on these um, each sample. So maybe a human said, this one was 10 out of 10, excellent story about unicorns. Uh, this one was 3 out of 10, maybe it didn't have anything to do with the, the topic, and this one was 6 out of 10, it was relevant but um, boring, or something like that, right? So I can collect this kind of data. Um, one problem with doing this is that these kinds of scales, like rate something from 1 to 10, they're very subjective. So uh, even if you say, you know, 1 means the story is completely terrible, a 10 means the story is amazing, those are still very subjective guidelines, right? And you can try and be more and more specific, but at some point, you know, you want this same scheme to work for any arbitrary prefix and any arbitrary sample. So you can't say things that are specific to stories, right? It's basically you want them to measure the overall quality of the sample, but that's extremely vague. So what people tend to do to avoid, um, you know, a lot of these issues with rating scales and their high variance and high subjectivity is instead ask for preference judgments. So if I have three of, of these samples, um, what they do in like ChatGPT or any of the other OpenAI models is that they ask their raters to rank the samples, like which one is the best. So maybe um, instead of this, Uh, we want something like S1 is better than S3, which is better than S2. So this is still very subjective, right? But it is less so, um, most likely, uh, because you know the preference is uh, not rated on an absolute measure, but rather relative to all the other samples. So this kind of feedback in the form of rankings of samples is what is used to uh, train 
uh, or tune these models further with uh, RLHF. So these are uh, rankings or preference judgments. Uh, we will talk more in a separate lecture about how you evaluate these kinds of samples. Like maybe you want some more information than just uh, which of the samples is preferred. But for now, we'll just stick with this. Yeah. Uh, that the samples are diverse. Uh, so in practice, you're not ensuring that the samples are diverse. There's nothing um, explicitly there. Uh, if you wanted, you could uh, play around with the temperature or the nucleus sampling um, probability cutoff to get more diverse generations. But if you notice on, say, OpenAI's API, they give you sliders to control all the hyperparameters of the decoding algorithm. So in general, this, this method is not, um, it's kind of generalizable to arbitrary decoding strategies, not just one. And some of them, the samples might be very similar to each other. Like say if you're doing translation, maybe you want low diversity. Maybe the samples differ in one word. Um, in others, they might be extremely different. Uh, so in all cases, you just want to be able to get preference judgments. If you had two samples that were identical, you probably wouldn't get preference judgments on these samples. OK. so. Of course, this is still hard, right? Especially for long form um, continuations or samples. Imagine the sample is thousands of words long, right? You can imagine it's extremely expensive to um, collect these kinds of um, preference judgments. So, um, extremely expensive to obtain. Uh, human feedback because ideally we want human feedback on the most complex types of prefixes the most complex instructions the longest uh, uh, continuations and this requires a lot of reading so um, this is like the primary reason why a company like OpenAI makes their models accessible to the public in this way they desperately need this feedback to continue improving their models. Um, at some point, if they decide they have enough, you know, they could just close all these services. But I, I feel like that's unlikely to happen given um, you know, all the popularity and the plugins that we're seeing now. Uh, let me, I forgot to check the YouTube comments. Oh, God. <laughs> OK. Sorry, everyone on YouTube. Um, how can chat GPT be conversational? Uh, yeah, that's uh, what you said is right. Um, also not super relevant here. Instruction tuning is just uh, a type of fine tuning that is correct. Instruction tuning is just fine tuning with a specific kind of data. Uh, I covered this one. Hello. Hello to you too. Um, is this what you were talking about when you said T5 can solve different tasks? Um, maybe. <laughs> uh, sorry, I should have checked these YouTube comments more frequently. Um, but yes, it is similar in the sense that T5 can be used to generate outputs for any different task. Um, can it be useful to give the model examples of wrong answers and train it to assign low probability on it? Uh, this is more similar to what is happening with the RLHF method that we'll talk about uh, in a bit. Um, yes, many possible generations is an issue with other language generation tasks, not just in instruction tuning. That is correct. How does the LM prioritize the output based on probability when a task has never been used to fine tune? Um, I'm not sure what the question is asking. Maybe you can ask it again. Uh, in the meantime, let me switch back over to this. OK, so we talked about how it's expensive to obtain this. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, does this fine tuning process sometimes also to effective decoding algorithm? Um, what do you mean? You mean in the? Let's say you decode it and then you're using. Oh, oh, in this setting. Yeah. Like if we were to use any sort of like RL or whatever to. Yeah. Does the fine tuning process also to effective decoding process? 
Uh, that is an interesting question. I don't think I can answer that without knowing uh, the composition of the uh, samples and which decoding algorithms uh, produce them in the models that we have today, because there are no details on, on that. Um, it is possible, uh, because you know, OpenAI sets their default uh, decoding algorithm, so most people are likely just using that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Okay, so um, let's say it's expensive to obtain human feedback, but we are able to obtain some amount of it. So ideally, we would be able to put in any prefix to our language model, get any sample, and obtain some sort of human preference judgment for, for that sample or a set of samples. However, we can't just have humans on demand as we're training this model, right? So uh, what ends up happening is that we train a model to mimic the human preference, the human ratings here. And this is called a reward model. So um, instead, we collect as many judgments as we can, sorry, human judgments as we can, and then train a model a reward model to predict the human preferences. So essentially, we will train a model to, given these three samples, um, predict that sample one should get a higher score than sample two uh, and sample three, and sample three should get a higher score than sample two. Um, so. The parameters of this model are, and, and of course, like this is an incredibly complicated task, right? Because a really large language model produced S1, S2, and S3. And so now we're asking another model to predict which one of these samples is better or worse than another. That probably requires a lot of language understanding and being able to judge relevance to the prefix and uh, being able to judge harmfulness or factuality or whatever, which maybe the original language model isn't even capable of doing itself, right? So we are asking a lot from this reward model to be able to mimic the human preferences. Nevertheless, that's what happens. Um, and possibly with enough high quality uh, human preferences, the models are able to generalize somewhat from this data. So the input to the reward model is a uh, sample s and a prefix, sorry, I should write those in reverse, a prefix p, what do we call it, x, x, uh, sample s. The output is a scalar score uh, represents the overall quality of the sample. So we're going to train this reward model not on absolute scores, right? We already talked about how these 10 out of 10 and 3 out of 10 are not good ways of um, obtaining human feedback. But we're going to train this model to just spit out scores such that the score of sample one in this case is higher than the score of sample two. The score of sample two is lower than that of sample three. Um, so uh, this is the general way in which we're going to do this process. The entire purpose of the reward model is so that we don't have to obtain human judgments for arbitrary prefixes during this optimization process. Like, we want to just obtain a fixed number of human judgments, train a model that we can then use uh, you know, very cheaply, right? We don't have to use humans um, to get more judgments. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at how this uh, reward model actually works. Um, so let's say we have two samples. 
Um, and we'll call them S good, which is the one that was preferred by a human, and S bad, uh, this is the one that was not preferred. So if we have these two samples, we're going to train our reward model with a very simple loss function. Um, loss of reward model equals the log, and this function is the sigmoid, R S good minus R S bad. So the sigmoid function just is a squeezing function. It makes the anything you put into it between 0 and 1. This is good for the purposes of normalizing these rewards. Um, and essentially what this is doing is we want the difference of uh, the reward for the, hot, the, the good example to be much higher than the reward for the, the worst example. So intuitively, the good sample's reward should be higher than that of the bad sample, and this loss accomplishes that. So how do you think we can implement a model with this loss function to give us a single score for any sample? Any ideas? Okay, anyone else? So remember some of the um, important attributes of this reward model. It needs to be able to understand language to a, a very high degree in order to you know, associate these human preferences with the text in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, I, you could train a BERT model. Um, that is uh, certainly completely valid. So you take a pre-trained BERT model, and the output, remember, is a single number, right? So maybe on top of the CLS token, you put a layer that just um, you know, projects the hidden token to a single number, and then you use this loss function with two samples, right? That is totally valid. That's a good idea. Um, and in fact, it's basically what happens, except the model is not BERT, but like some ginormous model instead, because bigger models um, have a better understanding of language. But other than that, you're, you're completely correct. Did you have a question? OK, so uh, just to write out how this might look, and there are many different reward model implementations in uh, papers that have been released. So in ChatGPT, they use a 7 billion parameter uh, language model, and they fine tune it to output this uh, reward score. Um, in DeepMinds, uh, whatever their paper was, they use a 70 billion uh, parameter um, language model as the reward model. Uh, so these reward models are enormous. They're probably the biggest reward models of any application of reinforcement learning that we've seen. Um, that's because, again, we are asking a huge, um, we're asking them to do so much, right? They need to understand each sample and give us these preference judgments which are completely non-trivial. So let me just draw out how this reward model could be implemented. Um, let's say I give you uh, sample good, we feed it to some like huge LM, and we get the vectors from this LM. Now we can do something like either average these vectors into a single one and then project this to a single score, like 8.0. We, we could do this projection by just, uh, you know, uh, how we've done these kinds of linear layers, right? The linear layer here would just be of shape d by 1, so we get a single number at the end. Um, Similarly, we will uh, pass S bad into our huge LM. We get another number like 6.7, and then we can apply this uh, loss function to 
um, you know, widen the gap between these two samples. Yes? Uh, does the S good and S bad include instructions? So this method is not specific to instructions. In general, it is, it, it will, because if you imagine like OpenAI's users are people who want to solve tasks with like a model like ChatGPT, so generally their prefixes include instructions, but it's not always the case, right? People might use it just for completion, so they might just paste in a partially written paragraph and see what the model generates next. That might also be included here. So um, actually what they did for the first version of ChatGPT is they um, hired human labelers for specific prompts. Um, so they hired a lot of people to do like code, uh, review of code generation for different programming languages. They hired people to check translations you know, they, have, they had a very high quality data set initially, then they got a much larger but noisier uh, one from the chat GPT interface. So they can iteratively use this method to improve their reward model as they get more and more data. Okay, so let's say we had a toxic output. Oh, oh, you mean an annotation? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, so the question is what if you have people who are thumbs up or thumbs downing the outputs maliciously? Like maybe they work for another company and they want to hurt ChatGPT so they thumbs down everything or something like that, right? Um, that's why the first time they did this, they again, they hired actual contractors to do the labeling and they, they still do that um, for more and more complex tasks. Uh, in general though, with that kind of user base, you know, most of the responses are probably of reasonable quality. I bet they have uh, filtering methods also to remove users who are behaving, or who have like outlier type behavior. So. Uh, again, I'm just speculating because we have no idea what they're actually doing, but um, yeah, I think it's a combination of a lot of expert feedback that they pay for combined with heavy filtering applied to the judgments that they're getting from their web interface. Okay, let me check uh, YouTube. Um, where are we here? Does the reward model share some parameters with the LLM? Ah, that's a good question. So. In general, the reward model is uh, initialized with the base model and trained on the, this loss function um, uh, and it's kept separate from the model that you actually try to improve. So the reward model's parameters are completely separate. They might all be initialized with the same base model, but uh, obviously the reward model can't generate text, right? It's just producing a single score. This huge LM is an encoder-only transformer, right? Actually, in all of these cases, the reward model is implemented by fine-tuning a decoder-only language model um, because these are like the best pre-trained language models that we have. So uh, at, I was just speculating on, you know, you can average the token level representations and then pass them in the linear layer. You can definitely do some other kind of pooling on top of these uh, vectors. Oh, you can't even see this. Those, these vectors that come out of the language model to get a single score. Um, but yeah, there's no reason it has to be an encoder-only transformer. Although I would say that your answer was um, you know, the most uh, reasonable because a model like BERT is kind of intended to be used for the, these kinds of tasks. There's just not a huge encoder model on the scale of one of these uh, other ones available. All right, so uh, we've talked, okay, sorry, that's for a different thing. <laughs> I don't know why that's in here. Well, what is, oh, I'm not using slides, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, what I wanted to say is these vectors here, uh, these are the output of your decoder-only language model, um, and these get uh, pooled some way into a single score. Okay, so we've talked about the reward model and why it's needed so that we don't need to just get a lot of humans uh, during the updating process. Uh, 
Now let's talk about how we use the reward model. Um, so let me just summarize. Uh, we can now use our reward model to obtain a score of any sample S generated from a prefix um, without needing a human label. So uh, the reward model is trained to mimic human preferences. So now let's talk about uh, several ways in which we can use the reward model to get better generations that are more aligned with human preferences. Um, let's see where I went here. Yeah. So we're at this point right now. We have a prefix x. We pass it into our base lm. We get, say, a couple samples, S1 and S2, via nucleus sampling. And now each of these samples, along with the prefix, um, goes into the reward model. And then we get a score. Of these. So this is what we've talked about to this point. Um, and now you can see that there are no humans in the loop anymore. The humans were used to train the reward model, but they're not used anywhere else in this process. Okay, any questions on this pipeline where we are so far? Yeah. Yes. So the question is, does the reward model see the prefix? The reward model needs to see the prefix, right? Otherwise, like S1 could be a great sample in isolation, like it could be perfectly fluent and coherent, but it could also be completely irrelevant to the instructions or whatever was in the prefix, right? So we need both in order to get the score. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So in the way I'm describing it now, we're only talking about a single prefix and response. Uh, they're probably doing something like concatenating all the previous history of the chats together uh, as a prefix and then uh, using it in their model. But you could also imagine more complex reinforcement learning algorithms that could apply it in multiple steps. Uh, so far, that's not been described in any paper of theirs. So uh, again, OpenAI is not very open with the details of these algorithms, so even in the paper that you read, you won't be able to implement the algorithm just from reading the paper. There's a lot of details there that are not uh, present. Uh, in fact, they're not present um, you know, in anywhere. There's a couple open source implementations of this method that <coughs> seem to work, but again, it's not been really verified yet, so okay. So the interesting question now is, how do we use our reward model to better align language models to human preferences? And so uh, the easiest method by far involves no training at all and is also extremely effective. Uh, the only downside is that it's very expensive at test time. Um, so this method we can call uh, over generation and re-ranking. Um, in some papers it's called best of n sampling. Um, it's basically like rejection sampling. Um, here, all you do is you 
generate n samples. Um, you score each with the reward model, pick the one with the highest reward. So this is, you know, super straightforward, right? I might have 10 samples that I generate given the same prefix. I score all of them with the reward model, and then I choose to output the highest scoring sample. Um, this is simple, but uh, even OpenAI acknowledges it's competitive with RLHF. Um, the highest scoring sample is usually much better than the lowest scoring sample. What are some potential downsides of this kind of method? Yes, so uh, if you actually updated your model to you know, increase the probability in general of a high scoring sample, then maybe you wouldn't have to do this kind of over-generation and re-ranking at all, right? Maybe any arbitrary sample from the model would just be better. Um, uh, so that's, that's definitely an issue. And that, that's connected to the larger issue of the, uh, this method doesn't actually update the base language model at all. So maybe it had some critical weaknesses that uh, you know, won't just be solved by this kind of uh, over-generation step you could generate 10 samples that are all harmful in some way, right? So you're not actually changing the behavior of the model with this method. Um, so that uh, brings us to the next method, which is uh, just a little bit more complex than this one. Um, oh, let me, maybe I should number these. Uh, okay, I'll also note that no, further training required. So in step two here, uh, oh, sorry, in method two, we will do some training. We could um, just fine tune the language model to maximize um, the probability of the good sample, the highest scoring sample, um, you know, uh, and that's it. So it's kind of combining these methods. So maybe we sample 10 different generations from the language model, we look at the highest scoring sample, and then we just fine tune the model to increase the probability of that sample. Yeah, so certainly in many cases, all the samples might be bad, and then this method might just pick the one that's slightly less bad and fine tune the model on that. However, you might, uh, you might not foresee the uh, change in behavior that this could have, right? Like maybe in one case, you actually do get a good sample, you increase its probability. This has a lot of effects on other samples for other prefix that you might not have foreseen, right? So I agree in general that is a big limitation. Like this probably can't, you know, result in dramatic changes to the behavior of the language model, but perhaps it can do better than just uh, over generation and ranking because it is changing the behavior to some extent. Um, okay, any other comments? Maybe I'll check YouTube again. Okay, go back here. All right. So then um, the, uh, and, and again, another issue of this uh, is um, what if, and, and this is kind of similar to what you said, so maybe I'll write both cases. What if S good is uh, not the, only acceptable high reward sample. So in doing this fine tuning, you might pick a high reward sample and increase its probability, but then uh, also decrease the probability of other high reward samples in doing so. Um, the other issue that 
she mentioned is what if s good itself is bad, right? So then you're uh, fine tuning the model to increase the uh, probability of some undesirable uh, output. Another thing to mention is that the reward model itself may not be the greatest thing, right? Like it might get the preferences wrong compared to an expert human. So that's always a factor with any of these methods, right? Like maybe the reward model messed up and uh, we're optimizing to something that's not actually aligned with human preferences. But that's something that, um, you know, everyone just, uh, it, it seems to work, so people go along with it. But these reward models are insanely large, so maybe they do exhibit high agreement with humans uh, in general, but it is something to be concerned about. Okay, so the final method here um, is to use reinforcement learning. Um, and the basic idea here, uh, intuitively, is to increase uh, the probability of S good given X uh, by some small amount, uh, decrease by a small amount where these amounts are functions of the rewards R is good and R is bad. Um, so essentially, you are accomplishing a very similar thing between method two and three, but three is just a little more clever in how exactly the probability of the good and bad sequence is being changed. Here also we're using all of the samples, not just uh, the best sample. Um, and if it turns out that the reward model thinks that all of these samples are, you know, uh, equally bad, right? We get a score, right? The reward model gives us a single number for each sample, then perhaps we won't make any updates to our model on that particular um, sample. But um, there is a lot of debate in the NLP community about uh, whether or not method three actually needs to use reinforcement learning. There are uh, other methods people have proposed but not tested at scale where what if you just uh, have the model predict the reward and then generate the text. Um, perhaps this will accomplish a similar thing, uh, like the same model generate the text of the reward or some feedback. There's a method called hindsight uh, tuning or something like that that came out of Berkeley that is a, a legitimate competitor to um, these methods. But anyway, we'll talk about the um, uh, reinforcement learning um, method right now. And we might cover some of the other ones later. Uh, I am curious as to next year when I teach this class if uh, I will be <laughs> focusing on the same topic or not. Uh, maybe there'll be a much better algorithm. But uh, yeah, you all get, get this one. So um, OK, and I'll try not to use too much of the RL terminology or assume any background, because this is not a reinforcement learning class. Um, so if you are interested in the details of PPO, which is the update rule that is used here, uh, this is not <laughs> in scope of this class. We, I encourage you to read the paper um, that uh, introduces PPO. But in general, like any RL update rule can be used uh, in this task, not just uh, PPO. PPO is uh, an algorithm developed by OpenAI, initially not for language, it was more for controlling like virtual agents in a physical environment and then um, it uh, got used for, uh, adapted for language modeling. Okay, so let's start with some details of this problem. First, uh, we observe a reward only, well, reward only after generating a full 
um, multi token sample by a, a decoding algorithm. So it's important to note that in the process of creating the sample, we have just executed a number of non-differentiable operations, right? We have sampled a single word from our vocabulary at each time step, and we've committed to that word. So um, it's very difficult for us to differentiate through these discrete decisions that we've made, um, which is why we observe this reward only at the end of the sequence, but we've made so many hard decisions between the beginning and the end of the sequence. And in this method right now, there are no partial rewards for um, like prefixes of the, the sample. Like maybe I generated, uh, there was a unicorn and it went to space, right? And then I get a reward after I generated that. But I don't have a reward for there was a unicorn, right? This in incremental part of the, the sample. I only ever reward for the full um, text. This is because my reward model was trained on complete samples, right? Not partial samples. So I can't just easily use it to get uh, rewards for the intermediate time steps. Um, okay, so we'll talk about the two different loss functions that are used in this kind of method at a high level. I'm not going to talk in detail about the actual PPO algorithm. So in general, uh, our goal is to um, obviously maximize P of S good, minimize P of S bad, subject to the reward. So we're going to have our initial loss function um, the RL loss, which is a function f of the reward, um, let's say for a given sample, rs and p of s given the prefix x. Um, and so, like, if you were using the simple reinforce algorithm, which is the simplest policy gradient algorithm, this would be all you need. In PPO, you additionally have uh, like a ratio term where you have the ratio between this probability P under the current model as well as the previous policy. And there's a bunch of other clipping and stuff going on that um, yeah, you can, you can check out if you're interested. But essentially, the probability P of S given X is modulated by a signal from the reward. That's uh, there's some function that combines both of these, and that is your um, loss from the RL term. So one thing that can happen if you optimize this loss is that uh, the model starts doing reward hacking. So it finds certain things that can maximize the reward in undesirable ways, um, where its actual behavior is not aligned to human preferences, but just aligned to um, maximizing this reward function, which as we know is noisy in itself, right? It's a model trained on noisy human judgments, so it's really not the most reliable thing. Um, so I should mention that this uh, loss can be computed with the reinforce algorithm. This is, uh, if you're interested, Williams 1992 or by the newer PPO um, algorithm. Uh, I think this is Shulman 2015 or 2016 or something. This is the newer one. Um, this one is used in chat GPT, GPT, whoops, for et cetera. Okay, so one more point is that uh, important not to deviate too much from the base LM to prevent things like reward hacking or over-optimization. Um, 
So what they additionally do in this method, the second critical loss function, add another loss at the token level um, that looks like this. Uh, basically, it approximates the KL divergence, which is a measure of how uh, close or far two distributions are from each other uh, between um, the current model. So that's the one that we're updating with RLHF. So I can call that P RLHF and the original model. So this is our pre-trained next word prediction model. I'll call it P base. And so this penalty um, for a given word in the sample, for a given word wi looks like log p r l h f of wi given all of the words that precede wi and additionally the prefix x over p base. Um, so essentially, if you deviate too much from the uh, predicted, sorry, from the base language model's distribution, you get penalized a lot. So even if your model is doing a better job of respecting the reward and lowering the probability of a bad reward sequence, if it does too much and it deviates too much from the base language model, then it gets penalized. So maybe it, it learns not to um, you know, change the base language model too much. So you can see that there's a bunch of hacks in, in this process, right? We really just want to change the model in a small amount to respect our, uh, you know, human preferences, but we don't want to, like, completely overwrite it to ruin a lot of the pre-trained knowledge that it has. Um, okay, so before I take questions, I'll just uh, draw out the final um, process that is used in the uh, like models like ChatGPT because I haven't talked about all of the hacks yet and so I just wanted to make that clear so there's one more very important thing you want to make it work in practice so we are going to start with our base pre-trained LM right this is the one we get from next word prediction over a huge data set um, the first thing we do before we do any of this reward or reinforcement learning stuff is we actually just use um, supervised uh, fine-tuning on high-quality examples. And so this is uh, one example of this is instruction tuning. So the very first step I'm going to do is essentially something similar to instruction tuning with an ex expert created data set. And so now I'm going to get this, let's call it instruction tuned LM. The next thing I'm going to do is train my reward model, right? So what I'm going to do is uh, generate a bunch of samples get human judgments and then these are used to train the reward model so humans come in here I'll just up here whoops whoa what is this um, so now the final step to go to this I will call it the RLHF aligned model is train with PPO using the predicted rewards. And the reward model is used in this process as well. And so this is the final pipeline of how you go from the base model to a model like ChatGPT like you see today. Uh, I just want to 
show you one figure from the um, paper that, uh, just to demonstrate how useful this technique is. So this is the uh, paper in the readings. Um, I think the very first figure here shows you some of the um, uh, the curve, the, the performance here. So this is a human evaluation of how often the output from uh, any of these models here, so PPO, these models are, are trained with uh, the reinforcement learning from human feedback. This one is just supervised fine tuning um, like on the expert demonstrations. And GPT is the one, the base LM without any sort of additional alignment. So you can see that this one is the worst. Uh, the y-axis is how often humans prefer the output of this model against a, competing, a competing model. This is the 175 billion uh, GPT-3, which has been supervised on um, human judgments. Uh, so you can see that um, if you use reinforcement learning from human feedback, the preference rate over supervised fine tuning increases to maybe 60, 65 uh, percent. So, you know, it's not a huge gain, but nevertheless, it is a consistent gain over, um, you know, not doing this RL process. So hopefully in the future, we will see better methods to align these language models that are maybe not as finicky as, uh, as this one, but certainly we can't argue with how effective it is. Okay, so I think I'm out of time. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them uh, after class. And yeah, see you on Wednesday.